Lee, the whole issue of the fine-tuning of the universe has uh, become uh, quite uh, quite hot in recent recent decades. Uh, theologians talk about it, and physicists uh, have, have perhaps reacted to that. And now we have multiple universes, or phys physicists, philosophers, theologians, all kind of mixed up in this. Uh, how, do you, how do you see it as a as a as a physicist uh, looking at the the issue of, of fine-tuning, and how do we explain it? First, the fine tuning seems right. Real. Real. That is, as far as we know, you know, Einstein's great question, did God have any choice in the creation of the universe? To the extent that we understand the fundamental laws, there was a choice. We don't know any reason why the parameters of the standard model, at least most of them, cannot be tuned and tuned to values where there would be no long lived stars, no many stable nuclei, and no clearly no life. So as an object, it seems very easy to do to to, to tune yes. to tune the, any of these parameters to where there's n no stars, no galaxies, no life. Yeah. So I like to talk about the anthropic observation. This is an observation that's been made, and unless we have stuff drastically wrong, I think it's right. Now then the question is, what's the explanation? This becomes part of the question of why these laws and not other laws. It requires explanation. Right. So what could possibly be the explanation? One is a fundamental theory, which can only come out this way, in which case we should all become mystics, you know, that somehow the mathematics that enforces the consistency creates exactly a universe which has, you know, a hundred stable nuclei, roughly, long-lived stars, etc. We should become mystics. Then there's the strong anthropic principle, which is a religious view. God, you know, George Ellis's view, somebody that I respect because he's out front about it. God made the universe so that there would be intelligent beings who would realize there was this conundrum, realize that the only answer could have been that there was a God who made the universe so that we would exist, so that rationally we would come to know his work and love him. This is what George Ellis says. And because it's out front, I respect it. I don't think it's science, but I respect it. Then there's the weak anthropic principle, what the cosmologists, you know, Martin Rees and so forth, people that I respect, but I think that they're mistaken because it's not science, in my view. And in my view, every claim that the anthropic principle has consequences for science is rests on a logical fallacy. I mean, there's this claim that Hoyle's argument, which maybe you've heard about, um, that um, and Weinberg putting a bound and on Weinberg, their, you know, on the so cosmological they, they, concept. They, they, they all have a logical fallacy in them. And if you like, I can, I mean, I can tell you, it's, it's very simple. Here's their argument. Okay. Um, carbon is essential for life. In fact, the universe has lots of carbon in it. Carbon could only have been made in certain processes in stars. Okay. Therefore, there must be a certain reaction, okay, which Hoyle then predicted and it was right, looked for right, a certain right. nuclear reaction. It was seen. Okay. What's the fallacy? The first line of the argument that carbon is necessary for life plays no role in the argument. The actual logical structure of the argument is we observe carbon to exist in plentiful amounts. Therefore, it must have been made. Therefore, there must have been a process that makes it. Okay. And, and in my reading, you know, in all the cases where some power is claimed for the anthropic principle, there's a fallacy. And so my sense... You're saying it has no predictability. It has no predictive power the, and no explanatory power. Right, but, and, and therefore you're saying it's not science. But yeah. that doesn't mean it's not true. You may not like it or it may not be science, but it, that doesn't, ipso facto, mean it's not true. Yeah, so one way to say this is that maybe the parameters of the standard model, the masses of the particles and so forth, move from the column of necessary truths that science has to explain is necessarily true to contingent truths, to aspects of the environment. And maybe there are different environments differently in different parts of the universe. And we happen to live where we can. So, yeah, so, so I, th I think that's a, if, you, if your first category is there's one absolute law, second category is there's uh, some intelligent designer, uh, which people are upfront about. And the third is that there are multiple replications, which is the multi-universe. I think what you're saying is that maybe those multiple replications are in the same universe in different places or over different times and either evolve temporally or, or spatially in some way. But isn't it the same principle? Either you generate it from many universes or you generate it sequentially? 
But before we go there, should I tell you what I really think? Can I yeah, tell you I'd love really to think? know. Okay. Because, yes, it might be true that what it would mean if the scenario in which there are these many independent universes and the parameters are randomly distributed and we live where we can live, is that our explanation has come to an end. There are things about the universe that we cannot more deeply understand. That we can't understand why the electron is the mass it is and so forth. There's no rational explanation of the kind that we're used to in science that leads to further predictions that right. we can check. Right. Okay. Maybe that's true, but it seems to me it's way premature to give up. Okay. So what I think about when I think about this is, first of all, I look for an alternative. Yeah, that's and, good. There's okay, no... I look for an alternative. It, the place I look is following, as I was saying when we were talking before, the methodology of natural selection. Because the biologists have shown that you can answer questions like this in a way that's predictive using the methodology of natural selection. And, I, and we could talk about you know, why, why that is. And then I wonder, what is the attraction of the anthropic principle? What I, I mean, I have great respect for Martin, you know, Andre Linde, you know, Steve, Lenny Susskind. Steve These Weinberg, are my heroes, yeah. Steve Weinberg. But I really want to ask them, what's the attraction of it for them at this place in time? And here's what I think, what I really think. This is going outside of science. Okay. Really think is that we have a bifurcation here in the history of science. Okay. Either we have to give up the view that what we're looking for is something which is timeless and, and think that really everything evolves, including possibly the laws. Okay. And so the barrier between physics and natural history will break down. Yes, yes. Okay. Or we have to make the following move. We have to say we, the world that we observe, which has all this evidence for change, and for even the laws changing, okay, is, is, is the wrong conclusion because we just see a tiny piece of reality. And we invent an unobservable, much larger reality, which, however, since we invent it, can be timeless and we move the focus from the ever-evolving world that we can see to an imaginary, positive, timeless world in which we can talk about probability distributions and apply the anthropic principle in a timeless way. So I, I think that the attraction of and the addiction to the idea that what we're looking for is fundamentally timeless is leading people to prefer imaginary multi-universes, it's not a quite, I'm not talking about what's true. Maybe they're right, maybe I'm wrong. But the, I understand but I, the but methodology, positive. but I st it still seems to me that the methodology you're talking about is very similar philosophically, because what you need to do is you need to solve the fine-tuning problem. But yes. everybody needs to do that. That's Absolutely. where we all start. We yes. need to solve that. And, and, and you and many people are increasingly believe that we're not going to solve it with one ultimate theory that that every from which it's derived uh, uh, unambiguously. Okay. So Although it would be wonderful if okay, everybody was wants an to. I mean, Steven yes. Weinberg said the same thing. Yes. He, he would love it to be. He, yes. just, he just doesn't see it. Yes. So okay. So now we have that situation. We have to generate, therefore, a whole series of different combinations, so that one of which can be self-selecting by by our pick. So. If, Guys generated through a multi-universe, forgetting the physics, I'm just looking about the philosophy. Yeah. You're generating it through a natural selection, temporally or, or geographically within the same spatial right. space-time continuum. Philosophically, it's the same. Here's what I think is different. I think there's a different understanding and attitude towards the most fundamental issue of all, which is time. In the direction that of eternal inflation and those kind of multiverses. Right. Okay. What they're reaching for is again a timeless reality. What's most fundamental is the probability distribution of different properties amongst the multi universes, yes. which is static, doesn't change in time. Time is only, yes. and many of my colleagues believe that time is some illusion which is emergent in some situations at some scale, but it's not fundamentally. Fundamentally, the universe is timeless. I think they're in the thralls of what I like to call the nostalgia for the absolute, this timeless absolute. And I think that the other branch, the other direction, leads to 
thinking that time is e even more fundamental than we expected before. Maybe time is the only thing that doesn't emerge. Maybe space is emergent, maybe the properties of elementary particles are emergent, again in the sense of the condensed matter physicists, in the sense of the biologists, that it's properties of collections of things that are not properties of things which are smaller. A lot could be emergent, but maybe time is not emergent. And if time is the most fundamental thing, then you end up, I mean, philosophically, I end up with a very different, looking for a very different kind of explanation in which evolution through time, change, causality is, is the key actor in the explanation, as opposed to go to a, pull back the focus large enough and nothing is changing. Yeah. My point again is that is that though you're, what you're both doing at the same time is is trying to figure out a mechanism to generate many different uh, uh, snapshots of the of the of the of fundamental laws of physics and the constant, so you can get one that suits our world. You, everybody yes, trying to figure yes, out yes. a bro broad enough number so you you don't need some intelligent designer. No, no, sure. And my belief is that to if this is to remain science, we have to do it in a way that leads to predictions that are checkable, that are falsifiable. And my understanding, so do you get the metaphor? One is you pull back the yeah, focus yeah, sure, sure. and time goes away. Right, right, right. right. Okay, and everything becomes probabilities. The other is you extend the focus, not in space, but going back in time. time. Sure, okay? sure. The bottom line is that through cosmological natural selection, there are predictions which are falsifiable, and through eternal inflation, there are no predictions which are falsifiable. My understanding is that that's not an accident. It's because the methodology of natural selection narrows probability distributions, gets you very, very far from averages, from equilibrium, gets you to structure for the same reason that in biology, processes in time make structure, make things that are more and more improbable, means things are more and more checkable. There are more and more improbable things. The fact that you find the same protein over thousands of species doing different things is highly improbable, but a consequence of natural selection. Okay. So my sense is that in the same way natural selection will generate things which are true but improbable. And that's how we're going to recognize its action.